here and wrap up. Uh, we're going to be going to topical studies on Wednesday nights. Topical study. Topical just means we choose a subject matter and we go through a subject instead of a book. And so we'll be taking topics and working our way through. It may be a character or it may be a doctrine, but we're going to work our way through um, different uh, topics of, of discussion as we learn more. Uh, on Wednesday nights, I want to try to make sure that uh, you, I know uh, a number of you guys get Sunday school teaching, and I'm glad that you do. Some of you don't. But I want to make sure that I also never neglect the idea that, that I, Scripture teaches that if you desire the office of a bishop, you ought to be apt to teach. Uh, and I am, I'm a teacher by heart. I want to be someone who imparts um, um, not just the knowledge of the book, but the application of the book and how the book is applicable unto you uh, in your current life. And that's what we've been trying to do as we work our way through Romans. Uh, this letter written by Paul to the church at Rome has been a practical book of instruction. If I could just recap for just a moment on how to take a, uh, a group of folks, um, actually two groups of folks, uh, Jews and Gentiles, and bringing those two people together to forsake their former selves and to create one new entity that had never been known before. My daddy used to teach me that there was a great mystery in the Old Testament and that the prophets could not see whenever they would prophesy. And he taught me that that great mystery was the church. The prophets could not foresee, the, the Israelite prophets, the Jewish prophets, could not foresee the future of the church where all people would be as one and would be blessed under the banner of the Messiah. They just couldn't comprehend that. And so here we are living in that mysterious age of the church. Uh, in the entity of the body that could not be um, com comprehended in the Old Testament and, by the way, can hardly be explained in the New Testament. It be goes beyond any explana explanation of how it came to be. So Paul is talking about that new body. It takes the, the Israelites, the very religious Jews, who held to the rudiments of the law and thought that works was somehow um, uh, a manifestation of their righteousness and it took the Gentiles who were on the other end of the scale and worshipped pagan gods and lived um, a lawless lifestyle and brought them out of their lawlessness and brought them out of their lawliness or their law observedness and made out of the twain one new entity that neither observed the law nor lawlessness but observed the new thing that we know of as grace and bound together in one body, one body now, the church. Now we've read a lot of stuff. Last week we talked about, um, as we shared with you, the idea of, of having empathy. I don't know if you were here last week. I spoke to you on the subject of empathy and having, uh, that, that we're supposed to go beyond just being able to tolerate others. We're supposed to be going to the place where we can actually take the, the place where we feel the impact uh, that things or, or, or people have in the lives of others. And we help bear that burden. We take their place. That's what empathy is. And so today we pick up in verse 5 after talking about empathy last week. And this is what I want you to see. Uh, as we pick up uh, after verse 4 that said... Uh, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, talking about the, the Scriptures, it was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures uh, might have hope. And then it goes on in verse 5 to say, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded. What is like-minded? Uh, the, of, of the same mind, of a, a same mindset, one toward another, according to to Christ Jesus. Our mindset should be toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. Now he's talking to the church. 
uh, a whole lot of preaching that goes on I, on Sunday mornings. I don't know if you notice or not, but a whole lot of my messages on Sunday morning, I direct purposely toward uh, getting born again. or salvation messages. I want to make sure I'm preaching the gospel. And that's, I figure that's my greatest opportunity to reach those that are lost on a Sunday morning, most likely. Uh, on, on Sunday nights, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we're in some area that will lift us up in the praise and worship of our Heavenly Father. And on Wednesday night, I want to come into practical application. And so here we are. I want you to look at the like-mindedness of one of them. Now, what I'm telling you is, is that uh, Paul's instruction says that the God of patience and consolation will give you the ability to be like-minded one to another. When I talk to the church, we're talking about us directing ourselves toward one another. I'm not talking about how you're going to conduct yourself with people outside the church. I'm talking about with each other right now. One toward another. Now, now listen to me. You think, well, that's not too hard, brother, buddy. You, I ain't never seen a family yet that don't have the visions in it. I'm just telling you the truth. And the larger the family, the more they are. That's just all. That's all there is to it. It's just. It's just the nature of things. Uh, and and I'm not condemning that. I, in fact, I'm telling you that that's the way God uh, knew it would be. And he's saying that in spite of your differences, not that you've got to change somebody to be like you, but in spite of your differences, you come together. That's the part I want to talk to you about. So we, we just read through these verses. Let me, let me see if I can get through uh, all the way down through verse 11. I will come back and, and see if I can teach this to you tonight. Uh, be like-minded one toward another according to Jesus Christ. And that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another. That's where I got my title. Receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, which means he was a minister of the Jews of Israel. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. When Jesus Christ was brought to this earth, he was a minister of the Jews. He was a Jewish rabbi that walked upon the face of this earth uh, to teach us the truth of God and to make the prophecies of the Old Testament um, um, forefathers come to pass. And in verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Here's the mystery of the church that they couldn't see in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ was revealed upon this earth that he might bring together the, uh, the, the, the law-abiding Jews and the lawless Gentiles that they might glorify God for his mercy under that one umbrella. As it is written, for this cause I will confess thee, I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Look at that. Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Who's his people? Israel. Rejoice ye Gentiles with Israel. It's, it's a picture of the church. And that, those were written in the Old Testament. Those scriptures are being quoted from the Old Testament. Yet they could not see how that could ever be that the Gentiles and Israel could ever be one together. And then verse 11, and again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. All ye people, who is that? That's everybody, not just Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles, everybody, heathens, come together under one, under one umbrella, and that umbrella is the grace and the mercy of an almighty God. Well, you say, brother, but that's very interesting. That's how the church came to be. What does that have to do with us today at Lanny Road Baptist Church in the year 2013? I'm glad you asked. Because as we come together today, there are still so many differences among us. There's differences of doctrine. There's differences of upbringing. There's differences of personalities and attitudes. There's differences of races. There's differences of, of all types of issues of our lives. I mean all types. If, if you was to take a, a, a poll today, uh, if we was to be able to pass out a survey 
to you and ask just 10 simple questions. And if there happen to be 50, maybe 60 people here tonight, uh, I believe that you, on all 10 of those questions, you are liable to get anywhere between 40 to 50 different answers. Maybe 60 different answers on some of those questions. That's just the way it is. I mean, that's just the way folks are. We're just as different as, as the wind blows, as they would say. We're just, we just, I mean, it depends on the questions, right? It really does. It just depends on the questions. I, I, we can get along real good as long as we stay in some particular areas. Have you ever been somewhere where somebody brings up the subject of, let's say, uh, politics? Or, or, or maybe this, or taxes? Uh, uh, or, or racism? You know, you ever been, or, or, or homosexuality? Uh, you ever been in, in, in a place where everything was going good that somebody had to mention some controversial thing? And then all of a sudden, other people who were not supposedly paying attention to your conversation had an opinion about what you were talking about. And all of a sudden, that good day went bad. All of a sudden, sour. Huh? Because it, it, it's just the nature of us to have those differing things. And so I'm going to say to you this. It is so easy for us to be in harmony and unity whenever we skirt around the issues instead of addressing them. I, it's so easy for me to call you brother and sister and see you for one hour on a Sunday morning and never know anything else about you the rest of the week. You come to, get, you come to church with your Sunday best on, I come with my Sunday best on. How you doing, brother? God, good to see you. I love you, brother. Love you, love you, love you, love you. Don't know nothing about him, but I love him. You know, I see the guy at the minute market more than I see him. But I love him. Love you, love you, love you. Don't know nothing about what's going on in his life. Don't really care. Love you, love you, love you. And we can get along and everything is great. But let, let, let us take some time to fellowship. Let us meet together for uh, outreach ministry on Tuesday nights and go together for a couple of hours. Let us get together for Bible studies on Tuesday mornings. And spend a couple of hours together. Let us go to the nursing home on Wednesdays and be able to spend some time together and then go to lunch afterwards. I know y'all go to lunch. I know y'all go to lunch. <laughs> don't even act like y'all don't go to lunch. I know y'all go to lunch. And let, let us spend some time like that. And, 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 and let, let us take time to work together in the building out there during the week. And let us spend hour after hour after hour sweating on each other. And, and, and then begin to know you. And I go, you know what? I don't know if I like that guy or not. I said, I said I loved him, but that was before I knew him. I can love you. I don't know why I picked on Bill, but he was just all over there by himself like a sore thumb sticking up. And I said, I'm going to choose him. I can love him as long as we don't touch on the things we disagree on. Paul wrote this letter to the church at Rome knowing that there were vast differences not just in who they thought ought to be president. There was vast differences in their religious beliefs and practices. There was vast differences in their lifestyles. There was differences in their language. There was differences in the things they thought they could eat and couldn't eat. We already talked about that a couple of chapters back. There was differences in what days they thought they could do things on and what they thought they could do and not do on those certain days. And other folks who thought you could do anything on any day you wanted to do. There was, there was just vast differences. If you wanted to go to the book of Acts, you'll find out there was vast differences on what they thought ought to be done with the funds that come into the church. That hadn't changed. Amen. There was vast differences amongst the church. And Paul writes to the church. And he says, I want you to be like-minded one toward another. So that, you, so that you speak with one mouth. What did he say? That was verse 15, 6, 15, 6 wasn't it? That you with one mind and one mouth would glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that. Huh? That you with one mind and one mouth would glorify God. Now, I, he must be his wound. 
What in the world makes him think that people are not only going to be able to get along together, but they're going to get so, uh, so well in tune with each other, they're going to be of one mind and they're going to speak with one voice. And with that one voice, they're going to glorify God. Now let me tell you something. There needs to be some signs and wonders in the church. There needs to be some miracles take place. If people are going to believe we serve a powerful, all-powerful, miracle-working God that's the same yesterday and today and forevermore. The greatest miracle I can think of is to take about 150 different people and get them to be with one mind and speak with one mouth and glorify God. That's about the greatest miracle I can think of. I, I, believe, that, I believe that takes a step above raising the dead. I'm telling you the truth. You think I'm kidding you? You know what the book of James says about the tongue? No man can tame it. It's an unruly, evil, full of what? Deadly poison. No man can, if you can control it, you control the whole body. That's what he said. In fact, it says if a man's perfect in his speech, then he's perfect throughout. So I take back my statement and I present it to you again. I believe it's a greater miracle than raising of the dead. Because Paul said it's untamable. I, I, if you've ever been there, you say amen right there. You know that's the truth. In fact, listen, listen to me. You're thinking about her tongue. I'm talking about my own. And that, it, it, it's, it's a given I can't control hers or his. That's a given. I know I can't stop t tongue waggers. I already know that. I knew that before I signed up. What is a surprise to me is I got seem to have little control of my own. Amen. I will purpose to keep my mouth shut. And I have the right. I don't have the ability. <laughs> It's the truth. It, with my hand up, it's the truth. I, I have determined I'm not going to say nothing, and before it's over, you watch me. You watch, I guarantee you. If I don't say it in front of you, I'll mumble it behind you. I got to say it. Just get, there it goes. And I'm thinking to myself, why can't I shut up? How come I couldn't hold on to that? I had it in the headlock. But it pushed on out there and did that anyway. I don't know. It's the absolute truth. Funny? That's because your envision's the last time you did that. Very same thing. So, so uh, Paul and his instructions is coming to us, and he's saying, look, there's differences amongst you. We've already talked about that all through the last several chapters, in fact, and then we've really bared on it the last two uh, chapters and, and verses headed up to here. And he said, you know, look, you need to be of one mind and one mouth to glorify God. Now, how are you going to do that? I'm going to tell you how you're going to do that. Look at verse 5 again. It's going to have to be the God of patience and consolation. The patience and con The one mind and one mouth means you need to have unity and harmony. Unity and harmony. And if you're going to get that done amongst people that are already diverse, then it's going to be accomplished by the God of patience and the God of consolation, which is a God of comfort. Which, I want to tell you what happens is, if you've got the Holy Spirit in control in your life, I'm not saying you don't got Him in your life, but if the Holy Spirit is in control in your life, there's something about that that allows you to let go and let God. Amen. I'm going to tell you that one more time because I want that to sink in because that's really good. You've been saved. You've got the Holy Ghost in you. But until he can be in control in your life is the only time you can come to a place of being comfortable with letting go and let God. Whatever comes is all right. Amen. Because he's in the driver's seat. I'm all right. Because the shepherd is with the sheep. He's in the sheep. And he cares for the sheep. And he covers the sheep. And he provides for the sheep. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. He provides. If he is there, 
and he's in control. And I am so comforted by that, I'm not going to be so worried about the differences that we have. It's not, I'm not going to sweat that at all, in fact. In fact, those differences can be a bond with us if I will trust God. I don't know if this is getting to you like it ought to or not. I've been praying, Lord, help me to teach this because I know this is something that's foreign. I mean, I, I could be preaching it in German or something because I only want to know it was David. And I'm, and, but I, he's not the only one that needs it tonight. We're just, we're just so different. And we need, we need to be able to have that cohesiveness. And it doesn't mean that we got to change. Because look, look at the next verse. I think it is verse 7, I believe, Brother Wade, we go to. It says, wherefore, wherefore change one another. No, not. It don't say change one another. So it don't say if you don't get along, then tell them to what you believe so they can come along and, and believe like you so you guys can be together. And ain't that what we try to do normally? If we find out we don't have things in common, we try to sway the opinion or the belief or the doctrine or, 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 or anything else that's causing the division. We try to sway them on that and say, won't you be like me? If you be like me, we can walk together. If you'll act like me, we can be together. If you will uh, like what I like. and you, When I was raising my kids, I used to think if I, my kids are going to like what I like if it kills them. They don't have a right to their own opinion. In fact, when I first got married, I thought my wife was supposed to do that same thing. But she took me to school. I found out she had an opinion. Of her own. Not just a opinion. <laughs> About everything. And how do you stay with somebody like that for 33 years? How do you make that kind of relationship profitable and loving? How can it become, how can it become where you're of one mind and one mouth? By saying yes, ma'am? No, that's not it. I thought that was it. I thought that was it. I'm telling you today, I know the secret. The, sec the secret is this. We don't have to be in agreement on everything in order to be in accord in every way. Isn't that wonderful? Because I can love, I can love you in spite and not agree. That's a good point. I can love you in spite of the differences. I don't have to agree with you. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not quite done because verse 7 is still there. Isn't that right? It didn't say let us change one another. It says let's receive one another. But look at the rest of the verse. As Christ also received us. Did he say, buddy, if you'll straighten up, I'll save you, boy. You, you can have part of this glory. You can come into this family of God if you'll just change your ways. That's not what he did. We sing the song for invitation all the time. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Just like I am. He reached further down. I don't know how far that was. Then I could reach up. And he brought me to where he is he did not require me to change myself into agreement with him. He loves me just as I am. Just like I am. Remarkable. Now, I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. In fact, the Bible says we now have the mind of Christ. I, we already talked about the Holy Spirit living in me. So you know if I've got the mind of Christ and the perfect Holy Ghost of God lives in me, then I'm perfect, right? What you mean no? I saw your ears moving. You said no. I'm a sinner. I, I still, I still am not in agreement with Him. He's holy, I'm not. And yet... With one like-mindedness and one mouth, we give glory unto God the Father. Amen. He calls me. 
his brother. He, he attaches himself and identifies himself with me who is a sinner. The holy God of heaven calls me his friend who is a sinner. How can he do such a thing? Why don't I have to get good before he can do that? Because he loves me in spite of the differences. So we receive one another like Christ received us. Are y'all getting this yet? If, 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 remember the parable Jesus gave about the guy that owed like, uh, I don't know, 150 bucks to somebody? And he, he called him in and, and he begged him. He said, man, if you'll have patience with me, I promise you I'll pay you back. And, and, the, and, and the Lord of that guy, the, the, the debt owner, said to him, I tell you what, your, debt, your debt's paid in full. I set you free from it. And the guy went out rejoicing that he had been set free from his debt. Remember that? And he found somebody, he found somebody that owed him like 10 cents or something. And he jacked him up in the corner and said, pay me what you owe me. He said, man, if you'll have patience with me, I promise you I'll pay you. He said, I ain't having patience with nothing. You're going to jail. Threw him in jail. Whenever the original debt owner heard about that, he called that guy back and said, hey, you received mercy at my hand. How come you could not give mercy? Listen to me for a second. Every single one of us in these pews tonight received mercy at the hand of the Almighty God. Amen? Every one of us forgiven a debt we could not pay. Hallelujah. Why is it we want to jack somebody up? I could say amen right there. We can go home. Good. But I ain't going. To. Right there. Receive ye one another like Christ received us to the glory of God. Now he says, I say that Christ was a, a minister of the circumcision of the truth. He came. He came representing the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Jews as they looked forward in history over the hills and the valleys to try to figure out what God was trying to show them. And they prophesied Messiah would come, but they didn't really know what that meant. They thought he was going to be the deliverer for Israel. In fact, even when he came, uh, all of those that were there that day, the, the apostles, all the disciples of his time, thought he had come to set them free from Roman domination. Messiah to them meant deliverer. They thought he meant political deliverance. But he was the deliverer, but that's not the kind of deliverance he came to deliver. Amen? The deliverance he came for was he come to represent the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Israelites. So here he comes on the scene, and he's the embodiment of that. In fact, Scripture says that he is the, um, he is the end of the law. Because he fulfilled the law in every way possible. That's what Jesus did. So here he is, the embodiment of everything God's ever taught the Israelites whatsoever. But that's not all. That's with this leg. With this foot, he's also everything that the Gentiles, that the pagan people of this world have ever needed to come in relationship to a real God because all the gods they've ever worshipped before have been idol gods, pagan gods or demon spirits. Every one of them. They've sacrificed their children to devils. They've ran them through the fire. They've, they've plunged knives into their chest that they may appease the demon gods they were worshiping, and God ties the religious sect of the Jews with the paganism of the Gentiles and brings them into the one body of the church, which is Jesus Christ. And the vast difference of all those peoples, he says, will be one mind and one mouth to give glory Unto God. You know why it gives glory unto God? Because only God can do that. Even in the age in which we live, if we have 200 people in this church and they come from all kinds of walks and backgrounds, if what they hear out of every voice, everywhere they turn around, is how great our God is, how great our God is, how great our God is, if that's all they hear, they talk to the children and they hear how great our God is. They talk to the seniors, they hear how great our God is. They talk to the people that are happy in church, they hear how great our God is. They talk to the people that just grumbled in church and 
And they still say how happy our God is. And they go like, wow, that must be God. It was Henry Blackaby that told us in his study, Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God, that what the church, what the world needs today is not to see a church on fire for God, but needs to see God in the church. Then their lives will be changed. When we come together with one mind, one mouth, when we drop the differences, there's things you do I don't like. I guarantee there's things I do you don't like. Oh, okay. Whatever. Get over it. Let's, let's, let's don't fuss about that. Let's don't worry about the, the, the schisms of the, of the idiosyncrasies that's in the lives of every single individual. Everybody can't be this good looking. <laughs> so we love one another. We love one another. That don't mean you approve of everything. But we love one another. We love one another in spite of it all. I'm so thankful. Peter denied our Lord. He had a chance to stand up for him. And Peter denied our Lord. Huh? When he, whenever, whenever it was all said and done and Christ come out of the tomb, he said, go tell Peter. I'm alive. And I'm going to come sing. And whenever, whenever they came together as a group of apostles again, can you imagine if the disciples said, we're going to meet over there, don't tell Peter. He betrayed Jesus. If I'd have been around the fire, bless God, I'd have stood up for him. You know? That's churches today, isn't it? Not? We're going to hold a meeting, but we ain't telling Peter. And they hold a meeting with Peter because, hey guys, what y'all doing? Nothing. Don't say nothing around him. He denied Jesus. That's not the way they did it. Jesus gave the example and said, it's forgiven and forgotten. Peter, I give to you the keys to the kingdom. I want you to go and preach the gospel to every creature. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. The others that stood by saw that. And they knew that if Christ forgave, then who were they to hold the grudge? Listen to me. I'm going to ask you the question. If God has forgiven, who are you? Who are you that you would hold anything against a brother or sister? <sighs> it's revival preaching right here. This is the application of how we come together. And you would, you would say to me, Pastor, that's just not possible. It's not possible people get along like that. That's exactly right. It's absolutely impossible, and that's the realm that God works in, is the realm of impossibility. That's why he's God. He works in the realm of impossibility. That makes it a miracle. When that happens, folks say, that's got to be God. Whenever they see a church that has that kind of, of cohesiveness about it, they go, God must be in the middle of those people. Because churches today are, so, are, are easier to split down the middle than a navel orange. It's the absolute truth. All you got to do is complain about the color of the walls or the carpet or something. And you can split the churches right down the middle today. Wouldn't it be good to have a schism-proofed church where the people were bonded together over something greater than whether or not we have a chandelier? over something greater than the differences that seem to, to, to stand between us? Wouldn't it be great if we were bonded together by the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ? We called one another brother and sister, knowing and being full aware that everyone around us is imperfect. That means not perfect. Every single one of us has issues, and yet... We choose to love like Christ loved anyway and receive one another 
without any stipulations or conditions. The idea is that we're to accept, I guess you got it by now, accept one another instead of seeking to change one another. We need to worship, and if we're going to worship, this, I believe this is going to be my, my final point. If we're going to be able to worship the one true and the living God, if there's going to be power inside the walls of this church or inside of the body of this church, if that's going to happen, then folks, we've got to be one mind and one voice. We've got to be bonded together. If we're going to worship one God, we've got to be one. We can't be many and worship one God. There is one God and one Lord over all. And He is the one that we serve. We're focused on Him. Uh, there may be many things we disagree on, but the main thing we do agree on, there's no God like our God. And the only way to have a relationship with that God is through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that He shed on Calvary that wipes my sin dead away forevermore. By grace, through faith, you're saved, and not by works. Lest any man should boast. It's placed in the absolute trusting hands of an almighty God. I am incapable of earning my salvation. Why would I require you to? I'm incapable of walking in righteousness. Why would I require you to? The requirements of the word of grace and mercy says that we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love our neighbor as ourself. That's the requirements of grace. Now some folks said, boy, I'm glad we're living in a day of grace instead of under the law because nobody could keep the law. Bless God, you think you're keeping this one? You think you're loving God with everything and loving your neighbor as yourself? Come on. You, 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 you think it was easier to keep, you think it's easier to keep this than it was to keep the ten? Come on, those guys had to make compared to what we got. I mean, all they had to do was live a certain way. Under the grace, you've got to be a certain way. You can't just act it on the outside, you've got to be it on the inside too. You can't be happy because you held back from popping somebody in the nose. And said, so, well, bless God, I'm, if I'd have been, he better be glad I wasn't who I was 10 years ago. I've, t- I've heard that so many times. Or if I ever see him at Walmart, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. The last one I got. And we, we think that because we contain our activity, that we've somehow fulfilled the law of love. Empathy, folks. Empathy says, I get to where you are. I get to feel what you feel. Whenever we have a difference, I understand why you differ with me. I can, I can empathize with your position as much as I can my own. I can, and, 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 I, and I remember, if we go back another chapter or two, it says, if, if, even if I disagree, I may even prefer your position above mine, even though I know my position has every authority to be right. Remember, not let your liberty be evil spoken of. So if this brother will be offended by something that I know is okay for me to do, I will eat meat no more as long as the world stands if it offends my brother. It's okay for me to eat meat, but I know he's offended by it. But, so what I do, I don't say, well, you know, just sneak around the corner and eat my meat anyway. You know, old dummy won't know what I'm doing unless he catches it between my teeth. So I always carry a toothpick. <laughs> but what, what the law of grace and mercy says is, I attend to that brother. I said, you know what, brother? I ain't going to eat no meat either. You don't like meat, I don't like meat. We're not going to eat meat today. Not today. I'm with you today. You know? This is the way we're walking today. It prefers the other. It moves into empathy. You say, brother, buddy, that ain't right. You're compromising. Now you're loving somebody. Amen. You're having compassion and mercy because meat is not worth destroying your brother over. Amen. That's what the Bible says. 
it's not worth it. There's some things that you just have been gnawing at and been gnawing at you. I'm fixing the clothes. This, cause this is altar time right here. There's been some things that have been gnawing at you and gnawing at you and gnawing at you and gnawing at you, and it don't amount to a hill of beans, whatever a hill of beans is. It don't, it don't amount to any, I mean, it just means nothing in the long run. It doesn't pertain to the saving of a soul. It has nothing to do with doctrinal imperfection. It just means you disagree with somebody. It just eating you alive. And you can't even have the joy of the Lord flowing through you because you just so miserable. And you're wishing the preacher to die or something so that you could get out of here. Because I'm tired of him always talking about us loving one another and loving one another. I don't know why he think we're loving one another. He ain't going to no orgy. I don't know what he's wanting to do about him going to loving one another. We are coming here. We are coming here to perfect the law of love. You hear me what I'm talking about? We're here to perfect the law of love. The pureness of love. I don't know where your minds is going. The pureness, the pureness of love and the law of love in the, in the, in the heart of God. Because we come together in the harmony and the unity of love. Yeah. I know. Tonight... We all sit there saying, right now we're saying, boy, I hope he's, they're paying attention to him. They really need that, preacher. <laughs> Bless God tonight. I believe with all of my heart, out of all the messages that we've had in the book of Romans, God's really beginning to ring the chisel around the heart of the matter with us tonight. Because if the, if the church is going to have power with God, we've got to be one people worshiping one God. With one mind and one mouth. Not many, but one. You say, but brother, I got something I got to say. No, you got something you want to say. There's many times that the greatest miracle that could be performed is for you to keep your mouth shut. It'll be right up there with partner Red Sea. So tonight, what I want to do, I want to close with, a, I want to close with altar prayer. I, I'm just going to have prayer. If you want to come and pray with me, um, I feel great conviction tonight. I feel great conviction. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and I'm going to ask God to help me to practice what I preach to a greater degree. If you'd like to join me with that, I welcome you to do that. If not, you might want to pray right where you are. That's fine too. I know. Maybe you can't get up and come and kneel, but I'm, I'm going to invite you to come. We're going to close that.